you see all this plastic-based 3D printer advertisement on the news with perfect parts and flawless print processes, you might know better that it actually looks like... <laughs> However, a new type of printer is becoming more affordable right now, the resin-based printers, which sport even shiner ads. However, in practice, it looks like So, let's understand these 3D printers better? Ok, I got it! You are well acquainted with FPM 3D printing. You know all about 3D printing with plastics, right? But you have been reading about this SLA technology lately and want to know more about the practice, not just the theory. I made this video for you. This is meant to be a very quick video to acquaint you with the practice of using SLA 3D printing, especially when compared to FDM. It does not delve deeply on theory, but this channel will spot a more comprehensive video about it eventually. Stay tuned! With the SLA technology, you have clearer, smoother, more high-resolution parts than with FDM, although with a build volume usually 3-4 times smaller than a typical FDM printer. This is a typical FDM printer called SETI 3D AIP. This is a typical SLA printer called CTC Euroway. It's a former clone. This is the VAT, also called Resin Tank. This fuse here raises and lowers the stage, which is this part here, which can be removed. The stage is the built platform to hit the print sticks to upside down. After the print is finished, you have to remove it from the stage. This particular printer has an USB cable which will be connected to the computer when the slicer is running, but can be disconnected when the printing starts. This acrylic lid filters ambient ultraviolet light, which could harden the resin, albeit slowly. That would ruin the vat because the hardened resin would stick to it. This printer uses an ultraviolet pin from below to harden the resin, which is directed by these mirrors on the bottom. There's also a motor here which inclines the support where the vat is, it makes that movement. This is a typical resin, yellow and opaque. It is here, it is used here. Uh, there are also transparent or clear resins, like the one on this part. And while for FDM, the layer height typically goes from 0.1 mm to 0.3 mm, for a SLA printer, they usually range from 0.025 mm 25 micra to 0.1 mm. This year shows signs of a high raise in sales of this kind of printers. Just like the FDM patent expired in 2009, which led to the 3D printing explosion, the stereolithography patent expired in 2014, paving the way for the appearance of low cost SLA 3D printers. Even before the patent expired, Two SLA printers, one in 2012, uh, that is the B9 Creator, and the other in 2013, that is Formlabs for One, were successfully crowdfunded through Kickstarter, both of which became successful to the point of becoming de facto market standards on which most other brands now rely. While the Form One is a pure SLA printer, that is, uses a computer controller UV light beam which plots its trajectory in each layer of the fabrication process, the B9 Creator is a SLA DLP printer, usually also referred as simply DLP, because instead of a focused light beam, 
It uses a digital light processing device, also known as a projector, for projecting each layer at once in a defined resolution, usually 1080p. From the description, you can get some artifacts of each method up front, while the form on like SLAs might have inaccuracy from distortion of the light beam in the corners, the P9 creator like SLA DLPs have to deal with the barely visible staircase effect of using digital resolution. These two 3D printers also differ very much on the market strategy. The B9 creator relies on a much more open approach to the point of open sourcing several parts of the printer, especially the slicer, B9 creator software, which is multi-platform. On the other hand, Formlabs, the Form1 company, chose to control every little part of, the, of their 3D printing ecosystem, which led to a proprietary slicer called Preform for Mac and Windows only, which uses a secret proprietary protocol to communicate with the printer. Even with that, it seems that the Form1 design is more often popular than the benign creators. The similarities between the two printers are also worth the mention. As they are meant to be low cost, both shows the cheapest of layering strategies. An SLA printer can be top down or bottom up, and this refers to the direction of the light, not of the movement of the resin bar. The more rare top down SLAs bring from the top into the vat below, which might be increasingly filled with resin or have a platform which is lowered into the vat. However, the much more popular bottom-up method sports a vat with a transparent bottom which is hit by the beam and a rising platform to which the first layer of hardened resin sticks, pulling the part. The bottom-up approach requires a lot less resin to print and has less waste, but suffers from degradation of the vat due to the loss of transparency. It also prints the part upside down. So, we got right to the problems of SLA. The vat is a consumable, and Formlabs recommends replacing it after only 2 liters of resin have been used on it. The transparent and non-sticking slab, though, is what matters. So, some people came up with a way to change it. It's made of PDMS, a silicone-based compound. A few brands use transparent PTFE instead of PDMS. It's cheaper to replace only the PDMS layer, but not much cheaper. A standard Form 1 Plus VAT costs $60, a half liter of Silga 184, the most used brand of PDMS, goes for about $45. And what about raw material? You can buy a spool of ABS for $22. But a liter of SLA resin goes from $60 to about $200. Usually, you can consider your cost to be 3 to 5 times bigger than with FDM. More specialized industrial resins might cost even more. Usually, the resins for Form 1 like SLAs are marginally $10 $20 more expensive than the ones for benign creator like SLAs. They are not completely compatible due to already mentioned factors and you have to pay attention to the specifications when you buy one. If you want to assure compatibility with your SLA, you must pay attention, at least to the curing wavelength. Uh, example, 405 nanometers, ultraviolet is from 100 to 400, visible light from 400 to 700. Power of the beam, example. 120 milliwatts or DLP brightness, example, 2700 lumens. It is usually more difficult to make a benign compatible resin work in a formula like SLA than the opposite, due both to the method peculiarities and the lack of flexibility of the SLA slicers. As I have stated in the introduction, advertisements do not prepare you for the failure rate of FDM. Same thing can be said about SLA, although, as it has less mechanical parts and no heating element, it is theoretically less prone to danger and failures. But failures exist, and you should be aware of that. 
First of all, it's very messy. You have to deal with mildly toxic slime, which is very viscous and sticks to everything, being also a pain to clean. You have to use vinyl gloves and other forms of protection, and also have liters, maybe gallons of isopropanol to help you deal with it. You also need microfiber cloth and paper towels. Aside from the resins, you are dealing with intense light here, so keep in mind that it is a risk of blinding if you accidentally expose yourself to the beam. And also, SLA printers require a big deal of maintenance, where a few domestic solutions might help, like cleaning the lens with a DSLR lens cleaning kit for the lens mirrors. There are lots of stuff to learn, from cleaning the vat, to reusing the resin, to properly taking care that the stage gets very closed and aligned to the bottom, lest the fist cured layer will not stick to it and remain the bottom, morphing to a barely recognizable horizontal blob of your print. Adhesion, by the way, is a big issue in SLA2, just as it was with FDN. You also need a spatula to get prints off the stage, which you might want to remove from the printer. A thin metal spatula is best. Some plastic ones can also work. As you are dealing with a viscous resin, if your layer has a big continuous flat section, when it is being lifted by the stage, it will form a big negative pressure that could just release the part and ruin your print. To prevent this, you can alter the geometry with holes to hollow sections to decrease the areas of negative pressure. And the easiest kind of prints for SLA are the Voronoi sculptures. Most of these changes are usually made outside the slicer in a specialized 3D model fixing software like Autodesk Mesh Mixer. In SLA slicers, you can add support and rotate incline the part. This usually thins the cross-sectional areas of the part and also makes otherwise uniform sections to be more gradual, distributing the pressure. Note that, different from FDM slicers, it is not common for SLA slicers to have in few percenters, it is usually just solid or hollow. The difference on support from FDM is that the SLA print is upside down, so the support resists pulling rather than pushing from gravity. Also, you don't have the weak layer adhesion problem from FDM. In SLA, the layers are so continuous you can have properly transparent solid parts. So, you are able to print very thin cylinders instead of big pillars, which saves on materials. There is another big issue about layers in SLA, the cutting mechanism. After each hardened layer, you cannot just raise the stage. The just cured layer has a big potential to stick to the bottom, so first you have to perform a small motion to unstick this layer and also to dislodge the resin so it fills the void. The form one does this with a lean motion from the vat. It does that. The B9 creator does this with a lateral motion and the open source Autodesk Ember printer does this with an arc motion. You might have heard of the Speedy Carbon 3D M1 SLA printer with an innovative technology which uses oxygen to prevent the layers from sticking to the bottom, saving the need for the time-expensive curling motion and enabling the printing to be completely continuous. Some people even adapted the b Creator, leveraging from its open-source nature, of course, to use something like that. And just as with FDM, there's post-processing of finishing the parts. Although horizontal layers are often visible, sometimes they happen. Sometimes you might suffer from alignment and calibration problems which distort the part. You might have rough or swollen surface where the light beam was too strong, having more resin than it should. You might have weak spots due to weak beams. As with FDM, in large parts, you might experience warping effects depending on the resin. Most times you also have sticky parts right out of the stage because curing is a slow process. Typically, you want first to bath the part in isopropanol 
for a while to clean the sticky residues and then, and only then, cut the supports. Only then you want to sand rough surfaces if needed. Even then, the part might still be somewhat soft or weak and might take weeks to complete the curing process or get to its maximum strength. Inflexible resin, for example, that can be as much as three times stronger than when fresh printed. You want to avoid oxygen when post-curing, because it slows the process. Instead of putting the part in direct sunlight, for example, you will prefer submerging it in clean water and let it rest in the sun. An ultraviolet curing chamber might be useful. Some printers like the Titan 1 DLP have the device as an optional. Some people use nail curing lamps or do-it-yourself chambers with ultraviolet LEDs to perform this task. Post-curing in excess can also cause warping along with cracks, decreasing of surface quality and pigmentation problems. Some upsides are also shared with FDM printers. A great variety of materials are appealing. Flexible, castable, extra round and high resolution resins are already available. With mass adoption, this market is prone to great diversification. There are even businesses that make customized resins for you. By the way, how can a resin be high resolution? Well, different materials have different energy absorptions, different wavelength curing and so on. Some formulations are better to focus the hardening energy in a small spot than others, which spread the energy. So, they are adequate for smaller voxels, like pixels in 3D, fine details. On the other hand, they will naturally make the print process go slower because of the high definition and will be more prone to fail at lower resolutions. So, as with FDM, it is a matter of balance. Which one is better, ABS or PLA? The answer is, depends on the application. So, these are the main points of dealing with a SLA printer. Since more people are buying it to use at home, there are some specialized products appearing, like more durable vats, cleaning solutions, special cloths, and so on. As an example, there is Yellow Magic, a cleaning solution sold on Amazon, which performs better than isopropanol. I hope you find the information here useful and feel motivated to join us in exploring this te wonderful technology. Happy printing!